Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Welcome to Summerland. I'm your guide, Jackie, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do and have here before I take you on a tour of the facilities. In our air-conditioned restaurant, we can cater for anyone from the individual diner to families and tour groups we also do functions such as weddings, conferences, birthday parties and so on. We have a delicious modern menu on offer in the restaurant, or perhaps you'd prefer to sit outside in the courtyard overlooking the lush tropical gardens. And for those booking a function, we devise an interesting set menu according to the type of celebration and the client's budget. If formal dining isn't what you're after, we operate a takeaway food bar, which has a range of light snacks and refreshments, just the thing if you're supervising children in the playground. The playground and picnic area makes a great alternative to the beach. If you've remembered to bring your bathing suit and a towel, you can cool off in the water spray park. Parents can sit back, relax, and enjoy a coffee while the kids have fun in our fully fenced shady playground and picnic area. What a way to make the most of the warmth and sunshine we have here in abundance. The older children will love to visit the historic cottage with their parents. This was the original homestead on the property and is now preserved as a museum with an educational DVD and cinema room. You'll find the information centre here also, and you'll be able to pick up some glossy brochures to take home with you and show your friends. Don't worry, we have more than enough leaflets for you to take home. Visit the gift shop and you'll find an enormous variety of local products, fine foods and handicrafts on sale. Some say that this is the best displayed and priced shop in the region. There is more to be admired and purchased in the garden nursery, which has an extensive range of flower pots, indoor and outdoor plants, statues, and all kinds of other garden accessories to adorn any home or garden. While we're on the topic of gifts and such, I must mention the woodcrafting shed and urge you to take a look at the amazing products that the woodcrafting team produces there. You'll be able to watch them at work and buy anything they've made. The toys they produce are not only original, but some of the finest craftwork you'll ever see. Take your little ones by the hand and keep an eye on them, because they'll want to play with these, but they can't be played with unless they're paid for. Last but not least are the orchards. The Summerland tourist attraction is actually a working farm with over 40 hectares of macadamia and avocado trees. The macadamia nuts are picked by machine from April through to September. The avocados are grown, hand-harvested, packed and marketed on site. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. I'm sure you are all aware that babies, infants, and children are exposed to an enormous number of potentially serious accidents all the time. Accidents where vehicles are involved are always awful, but particularly so when children are injured. Now, of course, most should never happen, but unfortunately, the casualty lists increase every year. It still surprises me that so many youngsters fall from shopping carts, for example. With small children, however, the highest proportion of accidents will occur inside the house or in the backyard. Many of the risks are obvious but are often ill-considered, even in well-organized homes. Older children are exposed to a greater number, for they are also open to the hazards of the adult world. This should be kept well in mind by parents. Education is vital. There are some very good television shows which do the job quite well, but children should be educated from the moment they learn to crawl, and so I'd say the best teachers are parents, who can instill safety habits in the responsive minds of their children by constant repetition. In this way, they will gradually learn to avoid the danger zones. Of course, if they go to preschool, there will be fewer hazards there, but I'm going to cover a few of the important household areas now. Firstly, kitchen hazards. The family kitchen is actually no place for a child, although children may spend a lot of time there with their mothers. All I can say is never leave saucepans on stoves with their handles jutting out. It's easy for little hands to seize hold of them, and adults can even catch themselves on them too. Scalding is a serious issue for grown-ups and children alike. If you are transporting dangerous items about the kitchen, always look to see where children are standing. Hot items are naturally high risk. Cooking with an infant at your feet can be very dangerous. Be careful with sharp and heavy objects as well. And not the least of dangers is treading on the child, or their hands or feet at any rate. Let's move on to poisoning now. An amazing number of household items are potentially lethal to babies but are often carelessly left around. Bleach, drain cleaner, and similar items should be kept out of reach of infants who have no idea of their risks. And a word of warning here, never reuse juice bottles as containers for lethal fluids and never leave these items within access of infants. Playground equipment deserves a mention too. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a crime prevention and fire safety officer talking to a group of new residents. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good evening. Last week, Mr. Jenkins spoke to you about home security. My name is Malcolm Fletcher, and tonight I'm going to talk about personal safety when driving and fire safety in the home. Of course, we shouldn't go around perpetually frightened of all the bad things that might happen to us, but there are some sensible precautions that we should all take to avoid getting hurt. You probably know already that a great number of serious assaults occur in the vicinity of motor vehicles. You should always be alert when walking to your car 
and check the rear seat of your car before getting in. This is especially important in isolated parking areas or the far corners of major shopping complexes. Now, once inside your car, get into the habit of locking the doors. Always keep the windows up and the doors locked, especially if you're travelling alone. If at all possible, steer clear of isolated roads after dark. Even with all the high-tech communication devices we have today, many serious crimes are committed on lonely back roads. Make sure your vehicle is mechanically sound, and ensure you have adequate fuel in the tank at all times. If your vehicle does break down in a lonely spot, lift the bonnet and then lock yourself inside the car and call for help on your mobile phone. Never under any circumstances leave your vehicle and go with a stranger to seek help. It is better to wait for the police or some other emergency vehicle to stop and offer assistance. Of course, you should never pick up a hitchhiker. Some of the most serious crimes committed in this country have been a direct result of this foolish practice. If you think you're being followed by someone in another vehicle, ideally you should drive to the nearest police station. But if there isn't one within easy reach, drive to the nearest open service station or shop, or the nearest occupied house. Now we are lucky enough to have a police station in this area. Do any of you know where it is? Look at this map on the screen, and I'll show you how to get to it from the community centre where you are now. Then, when you get home, you can work out how to get there from other directions. From the community centre, go along Bayview Street toward Maiden Avenue. At the roundabout, take the second exit onto Lee Street. Go past the medical clinic, and at the next roundabout, take the first exit onto Moore Street. You should continue on Moore Street until you have passed the little block of shops on the left and the church on the right. Stay on Moore Street until you go over the bridge, and then turn right into Canal Street. You'll find the police station on the corner of Canal Street and Cockleshell Court. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now let's move on to fire safety. Before I talk to you about safety precautions and procedures, I'd like to mention some of the effects of smoke and heat on humans. There are four ingredients of fire, namely oxygen, fuel, heat, and chain reactions. Almost all materials burn, and most household goods burn very easily. The air we breathe contains about 21% oxygen. As fire burns, it consumes oxygen, thereby reducing the oxygen content of the air. When that is reduced to 15%, oxygen deficiencies in body tissue cause an impairment of muscle control and dexterity. At between 10 and 14%, Judgment and reasoning are affected. Oxygen reduction to between 6 and 10% results in unconsciousness, and breathing stops. Sounds scary, doesn't it? But that's not all you have to worry about. Many materials in the home give off toxic gases as they burn. The main toxic gases are carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and nitrogen oxide. Carbon monoxide is an invisible and odourless gas produced in all fires. It takes up the place of oxygen in the blood, thereby reducing the supply of oxygen to the brain. The effect of carbon dioxide is to increase the heart rate and stimulate the rate of breathing, causing an increase in the intake of other toxic gases, which contributes to, amongst other symptoms, 
serious oxygen deprivation. Hydrogen sulfide, on the other hand, affects the nervous system, causing dizziness and pain in the respiratory system. It does occur naturally in volcanic gases and hot springs, and it also results from the bacterial breakdown of organic matter. You're probably familiar with it. You know, it has that characteristic odour of rotten eggs. But make no mistake, in large concentrations, it's deadly. Lastly, nitrogen oxide is another extremely poisonous gas at high levels of concentration, which deadens feeling in the throat and lungs, causes swelling in the throat, and a build-up of fluids in the lungs. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, can I help you? Um, yes. I wanted to join the library. OK. First of all, let me show you around the library and explain a few things for you. OK. Now we're here at the main entrance. You can see the reception, which is where you bring back and take out books. And also, we can order books and answer your questions there. Mm -hmm. Next to the reception, where you can see those old desks, is where we keep the magazines, because you can sit down and read there. They're divided into sections for sciences, geography, arts, etc. Then, at the back of the library, you can see the section for old books. Next to that is where the books proper start. That used to be the science section, but now on those shelves you'll find the art section. We had a big reorganisation in the summer, which I think has made it clearer. Oh. <laughs> the numbering is standard, so you should be able to find what you want quite easily. However, if you can't find something, it probably means it's been borrowed. OK, then in the corner, next to the reference section, is where we thought it was quietest and away from the phones and printers and things, so we've put the study desks there. They all have computer access if you need it for your laptop. No. We do ask that you don't just read magazines there, though. OK, uh, then there's the reference section, where you can look up the files. Then, as we come back to the main entrance, is the next section, where we used to have the languages. It got very busy and noisy, so when we moved everything round, we decided to put the law books here. Also, because it's a smaller section, it fits quite well here. Ah. OK then, we're back at the main entrance. Over there, by reception, there's a door that goes to the extension, and we have further sections, such as languages and study desks through there. So you could have a look round when we've finished. 
Then, just between reception and the door here, is where we decided to put the computers. But the computer magazines are in the magazine section. As we found, too many went missing here. <laughs> okay, is that everything? Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. I'm sorry, Vijay. What were you saying? I wanted to know what else I had to do. Oh, of course. Please go to the building on the other side of Smith Street. I want you to go to the reception area first. It's just inside the door on the left as you enter from Smith Street. Give them this form. Okay. Do I pay my fees there? No, but the fees office is in the same building. Go past the escalators and you'll see a games shop. It's in the corner. The fees office is between the games shop and the toilets. Thanks. Uh, where can I buy books? The bookshop is opposite the lifts. It's right next to the entrance from Robert Street. Your offices are spread out. Not as badly as they used to be. By the way, we offer very competitive overseas travel rates to our students. Oh, I'd like to look into that. Of course. The travel agency is at the Smith Street end of the building, in the corner next to the insurance office. Thank you very much. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to one of the Hong Kong's bank's lectures on money management. I'm John Rogers, and I'm the manager here. Money, they say, makes the world go round. Well, it is true that your world can come to a grinding halt if you have no money. I know you all agree, because that is why you have come here today. Okay, money. What do we want to do with it? Most people want to enjoy the money they earn today, but also put some aside for a rainy day, the kids' education, that big house in the country you've always dreamed of, and, of course, retirement. In other words, they want to invest it. So let's talk for a little while on spending money wisely today, and then I'll talk about the various types of investment you can make. The first question is, how much of your income should you enjoy spending today, and how much should you save for the future? And the answer is different for different people. It depends on things like age, your health, how many children you have, etc. Well, my initial answer is, write out a budget for the necessities. Food, rent, mortgage, and loan payments, clothing, health insurance, things like that. When most people do this, they say to themselves, My goodness, 
I really only need to spend fifteen hundred pounds a month. So how come I always spend nearly two and a half thousand? My mother used to tell me, look after the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves. What to do? Discipline. I suggest you take out the cash you need every week from the bank and keep a record of what you buy with your credit card. And you must strictly limit what you spend every month to, for example, your budget for essentials, plus an amount, say, 10%, for a bit of entertainment, if you want, and the unexpected, like house repairs, that birthday present you forgot about, things like that. If after three weeks you find that you have nearly spent your budget for the month, then stay at home for a week. No fancy restaurants or drinking with the boys. As they say, there's no free lunch. Okay, so what do you do with the money you don't spend? Oh, one thing I forgot to mention. It's a good idea to always have some money in a current deposit at the bank in case of big surprises. Say a thousand or so. Don't be tempted to use your credit card unless you absolutely have to. And get that safety cushion back in the bank as soon as you can. Right. So, what should you invest in? The list is endless. Real estate, stocks and shares, equity funds. Did I hear someone say gambling? Well, if you have a crystal ball, maybe. The government lottery? Someone once described it as a voluntary tax on fools. But I must admit I spend a pound or two on it every week. But no more. It brings a little bit of excitement into my life. Even though I know I have a better chance of being struck by lightning than winning. Okay, let's start off with a basic principle. In general, the higher the potential for making a fortune by buying shares of a particular company, the one you have been told will be the next IBM in three weeks, the higher the risk. We've all heard about the dot-com bubble of several years ago. Some people made a fortune, but they got out before the market crashed. The majority of investors lost their shirts. Another basic principle, the balanced portfolio. A balanced portfolio means you have investments in a variety of things from low-risk but low-return things to things like blue-chip stocks that are somewhat less predictable but which will probably provide steady, if not spectacular, returns for years to the riskiest of all, venture capital, where success could increase the value of your investment a hundredfold or failure could wipe it out. Well, why don't we break for a coffee now then I will talk about the most common form of share ownership, common stock, which makes you become a part owner of the company itself, with voting rights and entitlement to dividend distribution, if there is one. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.